Welcome to the Civic Lab Show, program number two. My name is Tom Tresser, and I am the vice president of the Civic Lab, and my special guest returning is my good friend and colleague, Jonathan Peck. Hey. Hey. Uh, our, our president and CEO of the Civic Lab. Now, um, last week, uh, we started our show, and um, we had some other things planned for tonight, but something happened that was so important that we decided That's to right. sort of... Uh, make some adjustments in our programming, and um, because today, uh, October 23rd, 2019, was Mayor uh, Lori Lightfoot's first budget address to the city of Chicago. So she was putting forth her 2020 uh, budget, mm -hmm. and uh, this is this our first chance to hear from her what her priorities were. And... Um, to sort of key up the uh, discussion that we're going to have and take and discuss that budget, we'd like to play for you uh, a short clip. Uh, this was Reverend uh, Akre's, um, uh, Ira Akre's in, uh, convocation or his prayer that he opened up the budget meeting. So let's listen. It's about two minutes. Let's listen. Which will be delivered by Pastor Ira Akre of Greater St. John Bible Church on the Great West Side. Thank you for the honor. Can we bow our heads? <clears throat> Most holy and everlasting God, we come before your presence asking for your spirit to intervene in this vitally important city council meeting. Lord, touch these elected officials who've been entrusted with the responsibility of reviewing and approving annual budgets. As we gather downtown in the third largest metropolis of America in the presence of elected officials sitting at their marble desks, in positions of power to ratify budgets. Lord, give them a heart for those in the margins. I pray that they remember the words of Scripture. Woe to those who offend the least of these. It would be better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck. As this council prepares to hear our mayor's budget address, <clears throat> may they be reminded that a budget is a moral document that reflects the values and priorities of a city. Lord, other people have unions to represent them and advocates to speak for them, but I'm here as a divine lobbyist for the poor, funded by heaven, and I come condemning budgets that scapegoat the poor, fatten the rich, and demand sacrifice, mostly from those who can least afford it. I envision a city where in the least, the last, and the lost will not be left out of budget priorities. I call on you, Lord, to convict the conscience of this council, the body that has the authority to assess fines and raise taxes with just one stroke of a pen. Lord, let this budget reflect justice and parity and combat social inequities. Let this be the last year that we see a budget that undergirds and expands on the ugly tale of two cities, the narrative and reality that painfully haunts us all. Lord, make us one here in Chicago. Let this be the last year that our city budget engages in reverse Robin Hood tax tactics of taking tip dollars from the poor and giving to the rich. Let this be the last year that $900 million of tax dollars go to the wealthy side of town while people are hurting and while disinvestment and displacement goes on on the other side of town. <laughs> May everyone be reminded that God, you are watching and your eyes in every place beholding the evil and the good. These blessings I ask in the spirit Okay. okay, so, so that, that was the Reverend, Reverend Ira Acri from, from the Greater St. John Bible Church on the Great West Side opening the uh, mayor's first budget, budget address, address this morning in the city council of Chicago. I'd, I'd have, have to say, say Jonathan, Jonathan, my headline is Reverend's Prayer Unanswered. Yeah, yeah I, think I think it was a powerful uh, uh, opening. opening. I, I think, think it set the tone and the framework. framework. Uh, Reverend, Reverend Acri is coming from the Great West Side. 
and, and it, it's, it's no, no surprise, surprise that that's one of the hardest, hardest areas of mm-hmm. tiffs. Tiffs. It has, has been, been historically neglected, underinvested, under, underinvested neglected, um, all the above, subjected, everything. And so I think he came in. I'm looking, it's a powerful thing to come into the halls of power yeah. to a new council, a new mayor, and say, look it, we got to get this, this ship in order, this house in order. And I think, you know, he was speaking truth to power. So and he has, he has a mandate from his parishioners and his stakeholders. So this is, this is a, l- a little bit what he said, uh, d- just some things that I reacted to. He said a budget is a moral document. That's right. So we believe that at the Civic Lab, we say, you know, as you're planning your own personal household budget, you make plans for the future, you know, whether you want to send your kids to college, you want to take a trip, you want to refurbish your house, whatever you're doing, it's the same for the city. Absolutely, 100%. And a budget reflects your values, your principles, your priorities, yeah. uh, where you want to put um, the, your political will. Yeah, and, uh, and, and who's, the, ahead, who's, who's ahead, who, who's, who's ahead and who's be- behind. So there are winners and losers. So, so the reverend made that point right at the top. He said a budget is a moral document ever so important for a city of Chicago. He said, um, quoting scripture, that we really must pay attention to the people at the margins, or as he said, the least and the lost. Um, meaning, I think, that our city budget for so long has... <laughs> not paid attention to the least. Yeah, I, I think that two minutes, uh, I think, is an incredible moment. I mean, if anything, it can show you how, what you can say in two minutes. <laughs> uh, and it, it, it reminds me of eerily of the civil rights speeches, um, calling, speaking truth to power about it's time to cash in on our, on our, on our, on our debt and our bills and going to Congress. He came to City Hall with a clear message of justice with a clear message of a uh, reverse Robin Hood, you know, putting the 900 million back into the neighborhoods yeah. and stop supporting and, and creating this hyper affluent um, district in neighborhoods in the yeah, north side. He, he specifically called out the 900 million dollars, which I believe is a reference to the super tiff, yes, the Lincoln Yards tiff, which the mayor did not address. Now uh, he also said that um, it's time to stop the reverse Robin Hood of of tiff money. Uh, and we're speaking about tax increment financing and just general city finances flowing from the poorest communities, the communities of color, black and brown communities, flowing from those communities into the affluent communities. So this is how he started the morning, by calling us uh, to attention, to pay attention to those uh, important points. And then, of course, uh, the mayor took the podium. Absolutely. It set the tone, and I think it set the bar high uh, for the mayor's speech. But it also set us a goal as a city, as, as, as a Chicago community. If anything, uh, this, this goal of equity and justice is fairness can be reached. And um, our, our campaign to abolish and end TIFFs um, is reaching into the neighborhoods and into the institutions that reflect the black and brown communities. So I'm very excited and very um, grateful that the Reverend Acre came into the powers, hmm. um, the halls of power, as you say, in terms of the city hall, city council, and spoke truth to power right in those two minutes. Right there. Right there. And uh, we'll get to our campaign in a minute, uh, but let's let's turn our attention a little bit to um, some of the particulars of the mayor's remarks. Uh, I should say this is being broadcast live right now uh, uh, on this particular day. This This broadcast will live on the internet in the future, but for right now, if you're on Facebook, at facebook.com slash T-O-M-T-E-E, Tom T. Uh, you can comment, and we will keep our eyes on the screen here and try to re- address your comments um, as you make them. So we will uh, be watching for those. So uh, the, for those of you watching, uh, we're, we're, we're listening. So what did she say? Um, you know, um, I think, as I'm recalling her remarks, one of the things she's saying, she's trying not to balance the budget on the backs of poor and working class people. So this is something that's been a, a kind of a watchword of hers. She uses the words equity a lot, mm-hmm. transparency, um, fairness, these, these kinds of social justice words that are very hot right now. Mm-hmm. But um, so, so for, for sure she did say that, uh, that there is no meaningful property tax hike in her plans at this time. So this is good news for and, a lot but, of people. And she didn't hold out. I mean, she did say she can't. She's not promising that there won't be in the future. That's right. So, so if if you're if you're a property owner or, or a renter, 
and you're hoping to hear some sort of definitive, you know, your bills aren't going up. Yeah, you're not quite. They are, they're going up regardless of what yeah. she does. So, that. so, <laughs> so that's the first thing. You know, people were thinking maybe she was going to come right out and bite the bullet and uh, announce uh, a property tax hike. That was not the case. Uh, she did mention that uh, some of her solutions are dependent on Springfield. So she wants some pension reform where the, where the pension debts are going to be rolled up. She wants um, a casino for Chicago, which is a whole separate issue. Uh, but that requires, again, some give and take with, from Springfield. So we're kind of uh, waiting to hear back from the governor and our allies in Springfield. Are you going to work with this mayor and um, give her what she wants or to be continued? So that was the point she made. Mm. She said that um, <laughs> she's going to do a few things for, for, for savings. She's going to refinance some debt. That's always smart. Um, she's going to go to the real estate transfer tax and uh, get another $50 million this year. So that is to say for those people who are selling wealthy properties, um, you know, expect to pay a little more. Uh, if you use rideshare, if you use your Uber <laughs> and your Lyft, your yeah, Lyft yeah. Uh, you're going to pay more uh, for congestion tax, con congestion tax in the loop between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. So, again, little little hits, little pieces of information. Mm -hmm. You know, um, she said there's going to be. She's not going to reopen the shuttered mental health clinics. So people were waiting to hear that, right. and she was pretty definitive that ain't going to happen. However, there's going to be an extra five million dollars funding for homelessness support and services, and increase the affordable housing units by 19% by throwing another $5 million uh, into the low-income housing trust fund. So again, I would say that's a crumb. Yeah, I, I, I mean, think, it's not nothing. Yes, yes. No, I think that what she offered in terms of addressing the challenges of homelessness, violence prevention, um, and all the other challenges, definitely all the combined are crumbs compared to what exists in the... Uh, the, the slush fund called so, so we're yeah we're we're, yes. we're like trying to give good news here you know and and I'm and I'm looking through some other things she said um, there's a, a program called Invest Southwest uh, and so this is um, for parts of the city here I'm going to hold this map up I know our friends at home may not quite be able to see this but you can just sort of see generally the areas highlighted in color um, are the ones going to be um, touched by this. As she says, seven hundred and fifty million dollars over three years, with some public and private support. So BMO Harris is going to put ten million dollars into this into this pot, but it's a little unclear how much of this is money that's already been in in the pipeline. How much is this is new money? Um, you know what exactly is the city going to um, put into this pot? So details forthcoming. But invest Southwest. If you're out in that part of the world, um, you know, you're going to want to know, is this something you're going to apply for? Uh, how is that going to work? Um, she wants to invest $500,000 in small business centers for underdeveloped or underserved communities. She wants to fast track the approval of signage. Mm -hmm. You know, so for, for, for people who have, um, you know, trying to start a business, it's always been a bit of a, a complaint how much red tape there is, and it's sort of People drives people crazy that it's a little some payoffs and some sluggishness downtown, you know, to try to get zoning permits and awnings and whatnot. And she's saying there's going to be a fast track ap ap approval for signage uh, from eight months to the same day that a person gets their business license. So she's kind of tipping her hat to, to your entrepreneurs and saying, you know, we're going to try to make it easier for you to start a business here. Okay. She wants to make Chicago a welcoming city, and she's doubled down on that and says, you know, uh, to the president and others uh, in the Republican Party, Chicago is going to remain a welcoming city. She wants to increase the, the minimum wage to $15 an hour by 2021. But honestly, by the time that comes around, we're going to have to go back and make it $30 an hour. Yeah, it's... <laughs> but, yes. Okay. Um, she's going to reestablish the Office of the Environment uh, and, um, and have that as a, a major part of her, her administration. And finally... Um, as she ran through these little bits of tidbits of information, she says, we must be about each other's business, she said. We're standing on the threshold of an historic moment in our city, and we will put everything on the line to fight 
so everyone has the opportunity to thrive. She got a little teary-eyed there. Yeah. All right. So there you <laughs> There you have Mayor, yeah. Mayor Lightfoot's first address. That's right. So what didn't she talk about, Jonathan? That well, I, I, think, <laughs> I think, you know, this is a speech. Let's be clear. Um, there's a lot in there to unpack. Uh, I think, you know, going item by item, um, for example, the refinancing of the debt is on the front end. Um, but that means that whatever she's doing on the front end, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. next year's budget will not have that type of, um, that type of setup in terms of refinancing. Yeah. Um, so that's an issue there. So yes, it's great to go for the short to address the immediate debt of any situation, but I, I do think that some of what we're doing now, um, we're going to feel the pinch in, in the next year's budget. Okay. I, I, you know, this casino relying on Springfield um, is a challenge of its own. I, I do credit her that, that she did not include any of that in terms of the revenue side, that she's not relying on the casino, relying on these potential. Deals to be made down there, right? To, to, um, and I should say, I should say, you know, I'm not a fan of casinos. I think it's a regressive thing that hits uh, poor people, especially. But um, I'm also kind of the person that says, "Hey, you're an adult. If, you, if there's going to be gambling, you know, buyer beware." I just, I just yeah, always I worry think, about yeah, it. I, I don't, worry about. I'm it. not a fan of casinos. I don't think it's a um, a long term solution no. to um, building a, a, a healthy. It, it, uh, Chicago. No, because um, you're, 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 you're kind of placing a bet against your own citizens. That's right. Because in order for the casino to, to pay off, you want everyone to come and use it and lose money, right. but you don't want your own people to come. Right. It's going to be hard to manage that. Now, in London, you know, they put like a $100 or a 100-pound uh, uh, application fee, so they keep just the average folks out of the casinos, and it's only for the higher rollers. Right. Um, I doubt if that's going to be the case here. But anyway... Um, that's we know that's part of the big picture. She didn't really address that. That's today. right. I mean, no, I know she also added she's adding. They're adding parking meters. In that's right. Areas. I heard that part. Yes, um, they're adding a, a slight tax increase in terms of eating out. Yes. Um, so th- these are all small things, small, small. And look, I recognize this is a huge challenge for anyone and for any team that would be uh, moving into an, uh, the office of mayor in city hall. And I think the challenge is it's all. There was a, I felt like there was more spin um, in terms of using those great words of fairness and equity. And, and um, you know, she tried to, to bring in the stories of people struggling and this and that. And the reality is, from, from my perspective, um, I think, you know, we, we're still sitting on a huge um, cash cow called TIFFs. Yeah. Um, and I think that uh, I was disappointed. And, um, I, you know, Reverend Acre's, um prayers did go unanswered. Um, the, the TIF relief in terms of ending it, um, she did not announce that. Um, what she did announce, I believe, proves us proved to us that that she has the power as as the mayor to make All any right. decision she want to make. All right, let's get it. to it now. So, <laughs> let's get in there. Sorry, so I, I, I so, want to go right into that part. But, yeah. Well, yeah. so you know, for the for the folks watching, uh, you know, th- they know that the, the Civic Lab has been on the TIF's case since 2012, really, with the launch of the TIF Illumination Project. In 2013. And just real quick, though, before that, I will say, as far as Invest Southwest, I mean, whatever she says doesn't mean anything until you get the details. Okay. Um, it's not the first time that, you know, millions of dollars has been supposedly set up between a partnership of private and community yeah. to address issues yeah. on the south and west side. Yeah, right. And so I think that, that until that's actually seen, um, I think um, buyer beware. Hmm. I think everybody... Um, who is concerned about the budget, their personal budget, their family budget, their neighborhood budget, um, needs to really roll up their sleeves and get inside this speech and this budget and start holding um, these these politicians accountable every step of the way. Yeah, I mean, uh, my shelf is full of these plans, yeah, it's, like Invest in the West and you know acronyms and whatnot from LISC and Ford Foundation, and everybody's got plans and things look pretty much like right. they've looked for the last 30 years. So the TIF Illumination Project at uh, TIFFreports.com has been trundling on since 2013. We've been in 143 public meetings across the city. We've looked at just about every TIF that That's there right. is. And uh, as the folks know, every year we do examine all the TIFs uh, to, to tell people, like, well, what's the story? How many TIFs are there? How much money are we talking about? And for 2018, I guess the number that people really need to remember, and I think we have some TIF money bags gra- graphics that we can put, display for you. There it is. $1.5 billion, Jonathan. That's yes. how much money, property tax dollars, 
We're not talking about magic beans or money that's not from the HMO feds. Paris Bank money. It's actual <laughs> your tax it's dollars. Your tax dollars, folks. <laughs> One point five billion. Now that's how much money we're sitting in the TIF accounts at the beginning of this calendar year, and and TIFs are kind of like checkbooks. Money comes in over the course of the year. Money goes out. So we're going to pretty much say that right now, right this very minute, there's an on order of one and a half billion dollars. Now, that's what we were kind of, you know, with our spider sense, we're waiting to hear with bated breath, will that be addressed? So she did not. What she said in her address today was that $31 million that's right. uh, from that pot of money is going to the city. So $31 million as opposed to $1.5 billion, I think that's like 0. .000. You know, percent. Um, in not, but she didn't announce in her in her, her uh, remarks today. But prior, she had said that she is declaring a three hundred million dollar TIF surplus. Yes. So that she didn't give the details today, but but it, it, it is in the, it is in the in the record that that's what has happened. So so to, to fill in, in case people didn't hear this, um, what the mayor has the power to do, just on her own authority, is to say. I declare a surplus in the TIF funds according to this amount of money. And it's up to her to say. Now, apparently, to get this $300 million, she had to sunset five TIFs. We're waiting to find out what five there are. When we know, we'll let you know. But five TIFs on her authority will be blinked out of existence, and the money in said TIFs will then flow into the city coffers and will be distributed according to the amount of ta tax monies that those units of government should have gotten in the first place, in which case the city of Chicago will get about $31 million, and the Board of Ed will get about $160 million. So this is good news. Mm -hmm. $160 million is better than a stick in the eye, but it's not as good as $830 million, which we're advocating for. So here's what we're doing. We are calling for the, the Civic Lab the complete abolition of TIFs. Um, cancel them out. Yeah, we need, we need to do exactly what Reverend Ackeray talked about. We need to end this reverse Robin Hood situation. Right. Um, enough is enough. Um, we have to end this ongoing cycle of the tale of two cities, the tale of three cities, the tale of four cities at this point. And uh, I think it's, it, it, look, at everybody in that hall, the aldermen, the mayor, all those administrators, people who are listening, clapping. Um, this has to end. Mm. Put the money back into the public services. End this egregious slush fund, which is completely racist. It is completely supporting the vast um, growth and development of affluent, hyper-affluent neighborhoods. Um, it's, it's putting money in, in developers and millionaires' pockets. Uh, it's just terrible. Yeah, I we mean, can't. The super mega tiff needs to end. We can't shut stress this down. enough. I mean, and just, we're done. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the, the Reverend was <laughs> it's pretty, awful. pretty on the point there when he talked about nine hundred million dollars going to the affluent community. So the Lincoln Yards tiff, just to remind everybody, Lincoln Yards is a giant development being pushed by the Sterling Bay Corporation along the river, at around Armitage, up uh, in Lincoln Park area, which the last time I checked was not blighted and not suffering from poverty or, uh, or lack of uh, resources. Last right. time I checked. However, they want to put this uh, giant $3 billion, pro $3 billion project up there with high rises and, and all manner of uh, luxury retail right along the river. And in order to do that, the city is giving them, has approved a $1.3 billion TIF. First thing that we say is uh, TIFs are secretive. So despite all the talk of transparency, I defy any journalist out there to recreate the data that the Civic Lab has created by telling people how much money has been taken out of their wards. You can't find it. TIF meetings are happening during the day. Uh, TIF meetings that are, are called by law are, are kind of dog and pony shows. And I've seen many uh, community meetings shut down and, dis and where the, the neighbors are disrespected because they you know, start asking questions. And... Um, and the, the, the process that got us the super tiffs for Lincoln Yards and Project 78 were the worst case of something being rammed through with so many hundreds and hundreds of people protesting and, and having questions. And it was go, go F yourselves, citizens. So the TIF process is secretive, and it's, um, 
leads to corruption. So when things happen in dark, you know, people are paid off. We've seen so many times where aldermen and the former mayors have gotten big money from developers. Well, we just saw one go down in the news. Wasn't which alderman? Um, Hopkins. Just, no, the, I mean recently uh, within the last what two or three days. If you check out your news stores, mm. um, th- there is an example that's coming out now about an alderman receiving uh, funds from a developer who received funds from the TIF. Well, so it's, it's ongoing. It's, it's very this common. Is, yeah, this is consistent. Our, our research shows that uh, every time we every time we're, we we have a little extra bandwidth where we can put someone on the case to look at these documents, we find conflicts of interest. Alderman Austin taking money from the developers in her ward at the at the community meeting where I announced it. Her chief of staff was in the room and she and he said um, she used the money to buy turkeys. I'm not making this up. Um, so yeah. Um, we see conflicts of interest w- w- between Alderman Burke, who uh, still stays in, uh, he's still in office, though he's not the chair of the Finance Committee anymore, and Alderman Solis, who was the chair of the Zoning Committee. Um, you know, he's wore a wire <laughs> for two years. So this process where the aldermen are getting money from developers and then turn around and give money to developers is, is corrupt on its face. Then we see that um, the, the, the process perverts an economic development planning process. So we believe that the city should have a powerful position in planning, you know, how to make people prosperous. I mean, the city was part of the redlining and racism that got us in this place in the first place, so the city should be powerful in getting us out of it. We got no, we got no problems with the city investing wisely, you know, in our communities. But this, but this TIF business has got us fighting for, for scraps, and frankly, it co-ops fighters in the community because they get hypnotized. Yeah, again, this is a, an age-old pattern that, um, that has been used by the Chicago machine to keep uh, the groups and the communities at each other's throats. So TIFFs, um, I believe, is following into that pattern. It happens a lot with other types of resources. Past mayors have used uh, has have dangled the carrot and yeah. say, "Hey, right. let's see who can jump the, high, the highest right. and speak the <laughs> get best and carrot. get behind me as a mayor." And so I think you know we need to end that. The TIFFs um, is a bigger carrot, uh, and and you know if you if you try to call it out for what it is, um, there's always plenty of room for the the politics and the machines to put their 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 organizations and their groups in front, saying, "Well, we got something out of it," mm-hmm. um, and the, and they probably did. Yeah, um, but you know. A $5 million or $10 million community development grant to build, rebuild your center or to rebuild a violence prevention strategy in your neighborhood is crumbs to the billions of dollars billions. that exists. So, um, so you, could, you, could, you know what? The best violence prevention strategy in Chicago? Hire 100,000 young put, people. Put them to work. Put them to work them to all work. year round, part time, targeting the, the hardest hit neighborhoods all year round. And we have the money to do and it. And we have the resources so, so, to do it. So here's my plea to, to our. our our progressive allies, our social justice brothers and sisters who are fighting the good fight in their communities, who, who may be tempted to try to save this TIF program and are working, you know, in that space. Please consider our arguments. You know, we'll come to, we'll come to a forum, we'll come to meetings, we'll come to dialoguing and sharing our, our, our reasonings with you. Well, I mean, in the reality, Tom, I don't hate to cut you off, but the reality is um, our community is already there. We have a, a, a well-respected reverend from the Great West Side um, pray <laughs> to end TIFFs. Yeah. And so if our groups are behind that eight ball, um, fortunately the Civic Lab is not. Uh, we've been critical for the past seven years. We have helped plant the seeds all across the city. 10,000 plus people have engaged with us directly. We have reached over 200,000 people um, with this message of fairness and equity. Yeah. Uh, and so we are, we're, I'm proud. Uh, of the organization, I'm proud of the work that you've done. I'm proud to work for all the volunteers of the Civic Lab Hundreds of volunteers. that have continued to stay vigilant and focused on this TIF Illumination project. And so now it's time for our allies to, to sit down with us. Um, this is a, a formal um, offer mm. by the president, myself, and the vice president to sit down and let's put together a comprehensive campaign to abolish and end this racist slush fund um, in Chicago. Um, billions of dollars are, be, are being diverted. Over $8 billion has been diverted over the past several years away from our neighborhoods. And that's money that could have gone to jobs. It could have gone to um, opening up community centers. It could have gone to making pipe, public libraries open 24-7. It could have gone to improving our, our South Side and West Side Park districts. It could have gone to entrepreneurship. 
establishing effective business corridors for small businesses, bringing a good portion of our community residents who run informal entrepreneurship-based businesses into the main sec- mainstream of the economy. That's money that has gone instead to developers and into neighborhoods that don't need those, those funds. That's right. So we, we, we sort of wrap up our analysis um, of TIFs by saying they're fundamentally unfair because they're non-distributive. So if you are someone who believes in, you know, in a kind of a progressive, re- redistributive, uh, restorative economics that is going to try to make some redress for, for the hundreds of years, uh, go stretching back to chattel slavery, through germ crow laws, through redlining, right up to the present day, um, you have to be cognizant of these larger contexts, these larger economic patterns that have been put in place, of which TIFs, we say, are the latest version. In order to, to, to fix some of this wrong, you're going to have to redistribute some of the wealth that the city gathers. It just can't be done by poor folks on their own. And that's part of the, 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 the sad lie of TIFs. If you're in a poor community or a struggling community and a leader tells you, we're going to put a TIF on you, and that's how we're going to save you or fix you or, or, or make you whole or give you some good things, that is a lie. It cannot happen. So the TIFs that are on the... Uh, the loop and the South Loop that are flush with over $300 million in cash, Jonathan, that money cannot, by law, find its way to the communities that we're speaking of. Can't be done. So for that reason, we say the TIFs are anti-distributive, unfair, and therefore racist. Put all the arguments together. It seems like... Yeah, I mean, look, the disproportionate impact in terms of, 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 of horrific neglect, um, dis- disinvestment um, is, is impacting the black and brown communities, the low-income black, black and brown communities of Chicago. Um, and at, so, you know, this notion that this is all economics, absolutely, this is all economics. And unfortunately, um, the black and brown communities are getting the, the, the rough end of the stick in this situation. Hmm. Uh, we have, you look at the maps of our neighborhoods now in 2020, um, it's the same maps that existed for the last 50, 60 years. We know where there is the lack of opportunity. We know where there is the lack of jobs. We know where there is extreme poverty. We know where there is homelessness. We know where there is um, increased violence and um, activity. All that is happening in predominantly black and brown poor communities. Okay, And so when you take out billions of dollars that could go to address these, our most salient issues, the impact is being felt by people of color, and most notably by black and brown people. So these policies are racist. These are econo- it is economic warfare. It is moving billions of dollars from these communities into rich, basically rich, affluent white communities in this city. And that's not the city that I want my children no, to live in. No. It's not the city that I want to live in. I want to live in a city that's fair, that's unified, that, that, that city that works for everybody. Not just for not just for the few that can afford it. Um, I don't want to be pushed out of this city. Um, I don't want to be pushed out of the city. I love living here. My family, we love being in Chicago. My kids love Chicago, and this level of displacement is absolutely targeting um, people of color. Hmm. You do not see 20, 15, 10, 12 thousand white people leaving the city every year. You do not see a reverse. You don't see that. What you actually see is a migration of the affluent coming into the city. Hmm. As while poor and people can't, poor people and low income people and, and middle class people can't afford to live here, right? And so, absolutely, this is a racist, extreme policy of economic racial warfare on black and brown communities, and it is disheartening to see a predominantly black and brown um, political body of leadership, um, most notably our city council and our mayor, who are now at the helm of this policy and practice, rather than shutting it down, they're tinkering with it and they're using it to manipulate and control um, neighborhoods and relationships and organizations. To throw out there that's, that we're going to put $30 million in here or to use this as that there's only $300 million surplus, to me, is, 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 is disingenuous. Mm-hmm. And then at the, in the same speech, you're talking about fairness and equity. No. Yeah, well, that's we, too much. Too much spin. We, we, got, a chief, um, we, got, a chief, we got a chief equity officer, uh, Candace Hunter. I spoke to her. We got a chief engagement o- officer, Carlos, uh, I think Linares is his name, I believe. Anyway, um, we have some people in place who are supposed to be leading this 
this charge, we ask them, what is their position on the Lincoln Yards TIFs? So if you are uh, fighting for justice in the city and you're fighting for equity in the city and that's your job, we want to know from you, what is your position on the Lincoln Yards TIFs? Are you for it or against it? Can we revisit it? Can we cancel it? Can we not take this $1.5 billion and put it to use immediately? Yes or no? If the mayor took $300 million, absolutely. why not the she, other yes. $1.2 billion? If mayor Emanuel did the same thing. He was playing politics, and he immediately gave, I believe, CPS $80 million one year. Something like $88 million. Right. Mm-hmm. And so if they can make those decisions like that, clearly they can shut this down. And let's not forget, of that $1.5 million, Tom, if we were to to put, pass it back to the public services, 56% would go straight to Chicago Public Schools. And let's be clear about Chicago Public Schools. Although um, the numbers are changing in the schools, it is still majority black and brown kids. And that's changing. But right now, as we stand, we're looking at close to 60% black and brown kids, kids of color in that school district, in the Chicago Public School, which is the, one of the largest school districts in the country. And that's $830 million dollars that's been yeah. taken away hey, from two, this district. Two thirds of the schools have no librarians. I'm sorry, you cannot have a world class city. I know this is the mayor, this mayor, and other mayors have always talked about making Chicago a world class city. You cannot have a world class city if our kids are not reading above grade level, and they can't do that if there's no <laughs> librarians in the schools. That's like not rocket science. All of the demands that um, CTU are making um, from nurses, bilingual education smaller class sizes, um, more special ed teachers, mm-hmm. um, putting back arts, culture into the schools, cleaner schools, um, technology, opening up the science floors that have been shut down. All of those challenges, um, I think $830 million could, could, would be could, a great start, start on that. to start addressing those issues <laughs> in this year, in this cycle. Yeah. Not in 2021. No. Not, in, not even 2020. You right can now. pass it over now in 2019. The strike could be over like Boom. in five minutes. And let's get started. Five minutes. Let's get to work. What's this? You know, come on. The money is there. I, 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 I'm saying, you know, maybe the union and the mayor are sort of playing power with each other. You know, remember, this union did not back this mayor for, 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 um, for, for the office. They backed uh, uh, President Preckwinkle. So maybe there's th- power dynamics, whatever. All we're saying is the money is there. The money is there. Now, if you don't want to use it, well, you know, we have right. a fight on our hands. But, but the Civic Lab is saying to the good people of Chicago, we are not broke. We are far from it. There's $1.5 billion sitting in the TIF funds. The mayor's chose to access $300 million for her purposes. I say good start. Go all the way. And end the TIFs now. Put the $830 million back into CPS. End the level of racial ethnic disparities in our schools. End this, end this level of, 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 of two cities, um, multiple different educations for some kids versus other kids. Every school in our district can be a level one school. Mm. Every school should have ac- full access to everything we've talked about. Um, we have 70% plus people, kids of color, black and brown kids and Asian kids in the schools. So yeah, this policy is having a disproportionate impact on black and brown kids. Gotta, and therefore, this is a racist gotta stop. slush fund. Um, end this corruption Shut now. it down. Shut it down. Go to uh, ntiffsnow.org. Sign the petition. Bring us to your community. Get a conversation going in your church, in your business group, in your block club. Call your alderman. Become a, a pest to your alderman. The alderman should have all kinds of answers for you. Why, if, if they think that we're wrong, the alderman should be ready to defend tips to you in, in language that you can understand and access. If they can't do it, you need to bother that alderman and, and, and stay in their face. Same thing for the mayor. Call the mayor up. Her number is on our website. If you go to civiclab.us, you'll see that information Absolutely. there for you. Now, Jonathan, um, the Civic Lab is offering some workshops uh, coming up um, in, in the next month. Now, we're broadcasting today in, in October... So workshops are going to happen in the month of November, but they're going to be happening later on as well if you should be getting to this uh, broadcast uh, you know, out of sequence. But tell us a little bit about the workshops that are sure. coming up. Sure. Um, a, a few years back, we launched um, the Power Institute. Um, it stands for People Organized to Win, Engage, and Resist. We launched it at an event that was focused on increasing women of color in, in, in the politics in terms of running for office. Uh, and we launched it because for several years – as we were engaging with our constituents and stakeholders around the, around the city with our Chicago's Not Broke book, uh, people kept saying, this is great information, now what do I do? How do I, get, now how do I take the knowledge that, you, that I've received and put this into practice? 
who do I who do I engage with first? How do I get more involved? What are what are the skills I need? What are the what are the you know the how tos? And so we launched the Power Institute to really help everyday people um, gain the baseline acumen, the baseline baseline knowledge, skills, and attributes to be able to take on power, to build power on behalf of their families, on behalf of their communities, on behalf of their organizations. So we do a whole series of what we call one on ones. These are baseline entry level trainings. Um, and uh, we've, we've trained over 200 individual Chicagoans and Northwest Indiana residents. Um, all of them have, 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 have either, are, either are, are from seasoned veterans in the activist world and organizing world to people just getting involved who came out who are angry about Trump or who are angry about an issue that's impacting their neighborhoods. And we've provided them the space to learn um, in context the history of Chicago because I think we all know it's important to understand the history right. um, of the political machine, um, of, of how, how the politics were built, how did we become the Chicago that we are today. And then we take them through um, baseline organizing 101, learning how to, um, how to, how to what, what does it mean to be an organizer, how do you organize. We give them a real life, we use real sort of experiential tools that are used in everyday organizing campaigns. So we give them a sense from the inside out about what organizing looks like, feels like, and how to implement that. And then we also do um, grassroots campaigning. If, you want to, if you're interested in running for office or if you're interested in running a grassroots campaign or being involved at any level of any electoral campaign or any grassroots campaign, we help you get from the inside out <laughs> those baselines. And we then also talk about TIFs yeah. and sort of how to That's read a city budget, <laughs> how do we access it, what's the knowledge, what's going on with that. Hey. We have other one-on-ones. But the four that we talk about are, are what we think are the most salient ones in this moment. Uh, we have trainings coming up, upcoming in Pilsen with our, with our partners at, at Pilsen Alliance. Uh, and we, we, what we're doing going forward, um, we're doing all of our trainings in the neighborhoods. So we did South Shore. Um, we're doing Pilsen um, in this round. And we want to continue to um, stay embedded in our neighborhoods with our partner organizations providing these, um, these trainings and these opportunities to grow your own skills so that you as a citizen, as a member of the community, can activate your own power and get involved and hold these politicians accountable. So the information is at uh, powerinstitute.us. You can see the, the, the schedule of the trainings and a little more description of the various sessions to, just to remind you. Chicago 101, how did our civics get so toxic? Community organizing 101, how do the powerless get power? Grassroots Campaigning 101, how do you win for justice in a place like Chicago? And TIFF 101, Fighting for Economic Justice, powerinstitute.us. And a, one, a caveat about the trains, all of the material you're receiving is uh, based on um, both Tom's and my, our, our combined um, experience on the front lines in Chicago politics. Um, we've also, it also includes not just our experience, but all of the people that we're connected to who have fought on the front lines in Chicago for the past 30 or 40 years. So these are, this is a, these are incredible, fresh, um, easily digestible trainings. Um, and they're, they're great if you're a veteran and you need a refresher course. They're awesome. Um, if you're just getting started, um, they're the perfect uh, entry into yeah, building a, a life <clears throat> of civic engagement. We had a lot of indigenous in people come into the Absolutely training. So, so um, you know, I ran for office myself in in 2010, I was the Green Party candidate for Cook County Board President running against uh, then Alderman Preckwinkle. And a friend of mine told me that uh, you haven't done democracy until you've lost an election. <laughs> right. So, you know, from my point of view, most of the people I meet every day, I want them to run for office. You know, I mean, people say, oh, ooh, Tom, running for office, that's like gargling with razor blades. I get that. It's, it's not, a, it's not a, a popular concept, but I really do think that is part of the answer for what ails us is that people like who, that are you're watching this video right now you're out there in the world you've got the stuff that we need to to, right. to, to bring truth you, to power if, absolutely so if you don't want and here's the thing even if you realize through our training you'll realize whether or not you you're able to run or you want to run yeah but even if you're not don't want to run it's important that you kind of know what you're looking for what do you look for in candidates? Yeah, yeah you can. What help, do you look for? You in, can help recruit you, what, candidates. Absolutely. Too. What do you look for in a campaign? Yeah, um, we're giving you that inside, um, inside outside strategy. Um, it's a comprehensive strategy of organizing and mobilizing and activism. The Civic Labs Power Institute provides that um, on the daily, and so we are amping up our trainings. Our goal is to train 500 
uh, Chicagoans on how to take power yeah. and how to move forward. Yeah, in like this. We're halfway there. And we're halfway there. <laughs> I mean, that's huge. Yeah. We're halfway there, yeah. and we're going to push to the finish line. So 16 people have come to our trainings and run for office. It's pretty amazing. Yep. You know, someone walks into a training or you engage someone in a community meeting and Absolutely. they get angry, and then they come to a workshop and they say, oh, this is, I can do this. Absolutely. You know, I'm going to do And I mean, Mrs. Brooks in the 21st Ward, she came to a workshop at the Civic Lab in 2000 and. Uh, 14, she got so angry about TIFFs. That's right. She ran for alderman in 2015. Uh, you can check out her video on our YouTube channel, Mrs. Doris Brooks. What a, what a wonderful lady. But again, um, we want more stories like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And when you get trained, you become an alumni. You actually become uh, a part of a network of Power Institute alumni who are all out there organizing and mobilizing and doing the work on the ground across the neighborhoods. So we're building the network, we're building the power base across the neighborhoods, and we're moving forward on all the most salient issues that we can address. The Civic Lab's focus is to help you, the everyday person, get activated, right? Get educated, activated, and move forward. Move forward, do something, make it happen. Um, I know these are tough times, you know, there's a lot of times people say, oh, I don't even wanna get out of bed. But really, this is the time to double down, you know, and be with your neighbors and be in solidarity. Um, and, you know, and, and I, for me, the glass is always half full, you know. That's right. You know, and so um, this is, this is uh, the work that, we, that we're committed to, uh, to um, bring people together Absolutely. for power and justice. And the reality is the next two years, 18 months, is probably one of the most crucial periods in our body of politics, both at the federal level, yeah. we have presidential elections. Right. Um, we're in the middle of recession. We have 18 more months. Um, we have major stuff happening at the local level. So the more our citizens, our people across the, the city get trained, um, get more informed about how to be a, a ma massive, major civic engager, um, now is the time. Now is the time, really. And, you know, and... In when we've been to the communities, as I say, we've been to 143 public meetings uh, over the last few years. You know, people are out there are angry, they're energized, they're curious, they have the ability to absorb this information. This is not above anybody's pay grade, um, and and they want to to act. They want to to be informed and act. You know, in a responsible manner for justice. So, uh, the time is right, ladies and gentlemen. So let's start by ending tiffs. So if you're gonna if you you want to take a little baby step. Go to our website, go to um, ntiffsnow.org uh, and sign that petition right now and put your voice, put your, pa put your name on the paper, make a comment, and then tell us that uh, you want to help. Right. And we, we'll, we, have an, we have an NTIFS Action Center that you can access yeah. when you uh, sign the petition, and so we're tracking that. Uh, and, you know, the, the reality is this, Tom. If we don't get involved now, um, we're giving up a city. Uh, and I don't think anybody wants that. No. I think we all want a city that we deserve. There's enough resources here in the city of Chicago right. that we all can gain opportunity from. Thanks. And so this is not a moment where, we, where we're absolutely broke. We are not broke. We have incredible talent. We have incredible treasures. That means be the people of Chicago are incredible people. And we've got incredible, we got the time. So we've got the time, the talent, the treasure to get to work. I will say this, though, about this situation we have to be careful. If if we don't get involved, if we're not paying attention, um, we're going to miss a lot. Mm. And so uh, at the very least, please sign up, join the Civic Lab, help us um, monitor and stay focused on watching and, um, and bringing to light um, the corruption and what's happening with our, with our political system in Chicago. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the conclusion of our show, the, the Civic Lab show here at the fantastic Hardlands media team. Uh, shout out to Absolutely. our crew here, Kid and, and uh, everyone else who's making this show possible. Everyone should check out Hardlands media. If you want to tell your story, please do come up by, here, by, by the studio and, and engage with them. These guys are amazing civic media technicians. And so what I would say is if we use everything we have, we have everything we need. And with that, we say good night. God bless. And we'll see you online.